As you might know, one of the real daunting statements in the Sermon on the Mount comes at the end of the magnificent fifth chapter. Jesus says, therefore be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And you might think, well, that sounds kind of daunting. I'm not even sure I'd want to do that. Oh, contraire. It doesn't mean follow the rules perfectly. It doesn't mean be a perfectionist. It means to be fully alive. The greatest teacher who ever lived in the greatest talk ever given uh, said that what is insurmountable in your life are not your problems, not your challenges, not even your own flaws. What's insurmountable is the kingdom of God, his presence and love in our midst. And so you can make this a golden rule day. And in this fifth chapter, Jesus has been contrasting the wrong kind of rightness, what he calls the righteousness, the scribes and the Pharisees, with what needs to surpass that. And he does all these contrasts. How do you deal with anger? And how do you deal with sexuality, lust, marriage, speech? And here's the final contrast. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, actually, love your neighbor, of course, is in Leviticus 19, is in the Old Testament. Hate your enemy is not actually in the Old Testament. A lot of times people would interpret parts of it. Psalm 139, God, don't I hate those who hate you, as called to hate folks. Those words are not there. They were quite ubiquitous in the ancient world. They were part of what Nicholas Walterstorff philosopher at Yale calls the law of retaliation. This is what generally runs our world. Um, quid pro quo, you do something nice for me, I'll do something nice for you. You hurt me, I'll hurt you back. Uh, old monograph on Roman culture was just called helping friends, hurting enemies. This is what Jesus is now re rejecting, repudiating. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you will see how lovable your enemies really are. No. So that through your kind heart, circumstances will magically turn out just as you want them to be because you deserve it. No. Something way better. So that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now I want to ask you to just think for a moment about God because this is very, very deep. How do we think about God? So many of us carry this picture of somebody who is strict or punitive or forbidding or distant. Dale Bruner says, when Jesus looks around him, what science calls nature, what the church calls creation, Jesus calls loving enemies. Every day, the world is filled with people who have lived in hatred of God. Now, of course, one of the problems is we think we know who the enemies are and who they're not, and we're on the right side. None of us do. But every day, God wakes up and says, I'm going to send more sun on him today. I'm going to give him some more rain today. I'm going to give him another breath of air in their lungs right now. I'm going to give him another beat of their heart right now. I'm going to have their neurons and synapses working right now. I'm going to give them some more food right now. I'm going to give them wonderful possibilities, and then maybe they'll come home. And then maybe they will come to know love. God never doesn't do that. To, to be able to love our enemies means to become his children, and that means there's kind of a family resemblance now. But to think about God... You know, the cross teaches us that God is the greatest enemy lover of all time. And that's the kingdom in which we're now invited to live. And then Jesus goes on. Again, there's this law of retaliation. On the positive side, somebody does something nice for you, you do something nice for them. He says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? That's like the bottom of the ethical barrel. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Now here, that little word, more than others, reflects back the beginning of this whole section. He says, unless your goodness um, surpasses, exceeds, and, and he uses that word here, uh, precisely the same thing. You know, if you're, just, if you're just doing that, then you're not, you don't have that kind of goodness that God wants for you. And then be perfect, therefore, 
as your heavenly father is perfect. And the idea of perfection here is not, you know, this obsessive, compulsive, neurotic rule follower. We don't have a good word for it. It would also be used to describe somebody who is mature or healthy or whole or sound. It's what you want more than anything else. And he's saying, don't have a distorted picture of what it means to be perfect like the rule followers in religion often do. Um, the right way to look at it is with God who loves so powerfully, so insurmountably that even hatred cannot overcome it. Be like that. Now see to this or way back in the Old Testament. In uh, Leviticus 19, um, where it says, love your neighbor as yourself. It also actually says, if your neighbor does something wrong, reprove him. And you might be thinking, oh, I'd like to sign up for that ministry. But it's a very powerful statement. It's actually um, own the responsibility of care for the moral and spiritual well-being of your neighbor. And then there'll be these little kind of grace notes. This is in the Revised Standard Version, Exodus chapter 23, verse 4. If you meet your enemy's ox or his ass going astray, you should bring it back to him. If you see the ass of one who hates you lying under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall help him to lift it up. The ethic of retaliation says, you do something bad to me, I will kick your ass. No, I will set your ass free. I will release your little ass from its burden. I will care for your little ass. I will send your little ass home. That we're living in a different kind of reality. And uh, a few words from Dallas Willard that are so powerful here. So often when people think of perfectionism, just in terms of rule following and this real strict neurotic thing, it's actually described somebody who is concerned more about their own reputation and their own well-being than anything else. And there's nothing robotic about it. Um, that's actually that kind of mechanical, um, don't blame me, I follow the rules correctly, is part of the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And, and part of what this means is that uh, applying what Jesus says, like, when do I turn the other cheek and when do I not? When do I give my cloak as well as my shirt? When do I go the second mile? It will always require judgment and discernment. This is what so many people do not understand about spiritual life in Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Here's Dallas. Of course, in each case, I must determine if the gift of my vulnerability, turn the other cheek, my goods, my time, go the second mile, my strength, is precisely appropriate. That is my responsibility before God. As a child of the king, I always live in his presence. By contrast, the way of law avoids individual responsibility for decision. It pushes the responsibility and possible blame onto God. That is one reason why people who must have a law for all their actions lead such pinched and impoverished lives and develop very little in the way of genuine depth of good character. I was talking to a good friend who's been in a lot of pain, part of a religious organization where there's fear that wrong has been done and the blame might be quite widespread. And she said, everybody just kind of retreats into their own corner and tries to show, I didn't do anything wrong. I followed the rules. Here it is. You can't blame me. And then there's isolation. And what gets lost is generosity and courage and compassion. And how can I help? It's the opposite of the kind of person that Jesus is seeking to develop. In every concrete situation, Dallas again, we have to ask ourselves not, did I do the specific things in Jesus' illustrations? Turn the cheek, go the second mile, give the cloak. Not, did I do the specific things in Jesus' illustrations, but am I being the kind of person Jesus' illustrations are illustrations of? What actually happens when one derives one's response from the reality of the kingdom is that the dynamics of personal interaction are transformed. See, generally wrongdoing requires collusion. 
So I want to be mad at you. And I do, I slap you in the cheek and then you get mad at me and then I feel justified. If somebody doesn't respond with hurt for hurt, they don't run away in fear. They simply stand, what do I do with that? See, it turns out evil is quite fragile and easily disrupted. What is really happening, Dallas writes, seeing our situation from the point of it, we are seeing our situation from the point of the view of eternity. And we know that we will be taken care of no matter what. We can be vulnerable because we are, in the end, simply invulnerable. We can be vulnerable because we are, in the end, simply invulnerable. And this is the message of Jesus on the cross. The ultimate vulnerability in the history of the human race humbled himself, taking on the very form of man, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has exalted him. We can be vulnerable. See, all of this is built on the reality of the kingdom and a God who is so filled with love that he could not help himself from loving his enemies. Dallas writes, when Jesus is on the cross, it wasn't hard for him to say, Father, forgive him. What would have been hard would have been for him to say, Father, curse him all. We've talked about how at the heart of resentment is rumination. So you've got to ask yourself now, how much do you think God ruminates? How much of God's existence is filled with God obsessively spiraling over who has treated him badly? That's not our God. That's not the God that Jesus teaches about. And I got to tell you, whatever you think, know about Jesus. I mean, know about God. There's a real good chance that Jesus knows more than you and me. So the invitation today is what might be called um, pearl prayers. You all know how uh, pearls are, are formed because uh, they're begun with a little irritant. And that little irritant uh, uh, elicits secretions that become a precious, precious thing. So, pray for your enemy. Doesn't have to be a big enemy. Somebody that irritates you. Somebody that you think doesn't like you. Somebody that disappoints you. Today, now, you can make yourself vulnerable because you are ultimately invulnerable. Make it a golden rule day. If you like hearing John talk about the Sermon on the Mount, we've got a whole series on that. So go ahead and subscribe to make sure you don't miss any future episodes in that series. You can also go back and catch up on any episodes that you may have missed. Now, if you're interested in the email or the text alert that goes along with each episode, you can let us know at becomenew.com slash subscribe, and we'll make sure that you get those. If you want to help us spread the word about Become New, the best way to do it is just to watch, like, and comment each video that we put out. So we would love to hear your thoughts. If you wanna chime in in the comments, that would help us and we'd love to engage with you there. Lastly, if you've got a prayer request, there's a group of us who meet each weekday to pray for viewers just like yourself. You can send us your prayer request to the number 855-888-0444 and we would love to pray for you. We'll catch you next time.